Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, it's really good of all of you to turn up and everybody online as well. Um, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about the, the age of the Norwich trams. And when we mention the Norwich trams, people often say, what? Or perhaps more often, did Norwich have trams? Well, as you will find out, they most certainly did. But the period was quite short. 1900 to 1935. But in that very short period of time, they made a significant impact. And that is what we will be talking about um, this afternoon, the impact of the trams. Um, now, of course, we are going back just a little bit further than we normally do. So it was hard for us to find people who had good memories, because obviously they'd be extremely old now. So we had to rely quite a lot on written accounts and particularly the local newspapers and it would be great to be able to have a, a journalist from those times with us but obviously we couldn't do that but we were very fortunate Derek James as many of you know is, is a local journalist who has written much about Norwich and Norfolk and um, he was very helpful so this afternoon you don't have two of us because Derek helped in the preparation of this um, presentation, so you have Derek James with us as well. However, enough of me, I'm going to keep quiet most of the time. Francis will do most of the talking. I do get the odd word in now and then. Um, so I shall shut up and pass across to Francis to tell us about the age of the trans. In 1900, trams first appeared on Norwich's streets. They were treated with awe as a technical wonder of the age. But today, we're going to show you that the story of Norwich's trams is about so much more than a vehicle. It's about how that vehicle changed a city and the lives of the people who lived here. But let's start by going back to 1895 where many of Norwich's streets were both narrow and bustling. A threefold increase in the city's population has put a huge strain on um, Norwich's roads. And Gentleman's Walk is just one of many that is chock-a-block with traffic. But more than this, as demand for homes rocketed, oops, as demand for homes rocketed, um, People found it difficult to find anywhere to live. And by now, um, inappropriate houses have been crammed behind older properties that line the main streets. And these horse houses, known as Courts and Yard, now provide accommodation for around 10% of the city's population. But of course, better, uh, um, better quality housing is available outside the city walls in the newly emerging suburbs on roads which already service um, our streets and many of you use today. So why didn't people move out to the suburbs? Well, there was a problem. If you moved out, you subsequently had to travel back into the city to your place of work. And to do this, you needed a reliable and cheap form of public transport. And herein lay the problem, because here we see one of the city's public transport vehicles of the day. And I think we can all agree that this is not a vehicle designed for mass public travel. Um, the absolute maximum you could carry would have been um, 14 passengers. Now, Luckily, one of those seats wasn't taken up by a conductor. Instead, to collect fares, the driver could lean across, open a flat door in the roof of the carriage and lean in to unsuspecting passengers below to collect the fares, which we always think must have given them a little bit of a shock. Um, of course, there were bigger vehicles, and in fact, the Norwich Omnibus Company that ran the service did introduce a double-decker. <laughs> But the absolute maximum the company could um, carry in any one day was 1,500 passengers. It was an inadequate service which inevitably um, tied lower income families to poor quality city centre accommodation. So can you imagine 
the excitement when it is proposed to build a new electric tramway in Norwich. After all, this is the most modern public transport vehicle known to man. And, and the evening news fired up the public, announcing, admittedly, with a little bit of hyperbole, there is no town the size of Norwich in um, Europe that has not got tramways. So it was more or less a given that most people did support us um, building the tramways. And similarly, it was more or less agreed that it was important to build tracks to those newly emerging suburbs and lead them into the city on those wide roads that we still use today. But what should happen in the city centre, where, as we've already said, streets were narrow, they were already chock-a-block with um, traffic and not really suitable to trams. Well, two companies put themselves forward to build and subsequently run the city's tramways. The first was the British Electric Traction Company. Now they proposed to build tracks from the suburbs into the city, but then rather than build through the city itself, they would build a track more or less around the outside and just come in on a couple of spurs. It was a, built a little bit like a ring road. But the other company, the um, new general traction company, <laughs> they didn't have any of the same qualms. Yes, they were bringing people in from the suburbs, but then they proposed to build tracks crisscrossing through the city centre streets. Now, as part of their bid, they offered um, to donate £44,000 to the city, equivalent to about £6 million today, um, for road improvements. And immediately, this made their bid very popular with the city council. And what is very clear, especially in retrospect, this offer of road improvement for a handful of roads blinded councillors to the absolute mayhem that could ensue on laying tracks on narrow roads not suited for tram travel. And I will give you a little example, King Street. King Street is 21 foot wide, yet it was proposed to build a track along it, despite the tracks being three foot six wide, the tram six foot six. And don't forget this, um, this street wasn't gonna be closed to other traffic. But despite such limitations, um, it is decided to um, give the, um, the contract to the new general traction company. And almost immediately, they set up a new um, firm, the Norwich Electric Tramways Company, who were given the task of building and subsequently running the city's trams. For the next three years, the city is in turmoil as roads are dug up, buildings demolished and tracks laid. But as we can see from this rather lovely photograph of uh, Magdalene Road, whoops, as we can see from this rather lovely photo of Magdalene Road, oh, sorry. <laughs> here, um, that they didn't worry themselves with such little things as um, health and safety, as here we can see children idly playing within a few feet of a mobile foundry, which is um, carrying molten iron, and we're not entirely sure, but we vaguely think that over there, we have a little fruit and veg salesman who set up stall in the middle of what is a building site. But the other thing that we can clearly see from this picture are the number of men who were involved in building the tracks. And this was a time when there was already a, um, there was a depression in agriculture, which saw many laborers coming into the city in search of work. And amongst their numbers uh, was a gentleman called Isaac Moss. And there we can see Isaac. He's taking a little rest from building the tracks on Newmarket Road. And we were lent this photograph by Isaac's um, granddaughter, Hazel, who told us that her granddad had come into the city because he wanted to earn enough money to marry his sweetheart, Lucy, which indeed he did in 1898. So we can sort of say with hand on heart, 
that the trams definitely did transform his life. We're now going to have a look at some of the changes that the trams made to the city centre. And we're going to start at the heart of the tramway system, which was in the Red Lion Street area. Now, looking at this map from 1884, you can see that the area consisted of quite a lot of very narrow streets, lanes, etc. So, to make this the centre of the tram system, make it the terminus for the trams, seems a little bit strange. But, as Francis said, this was tied in with road improvements. And this is the area which was most impacted. And we're going to start with three basic areas. The heart of the tramway system, the, the terminus itself, which became Orford Place, Red Lion Street, and the cut through to Castle Meadow. We'll start off with the creation of Orford Place, because Orford Place didn't exist before the trams. And we're going to start by looking at this triangle here. Now, as you can see, it's got loads of, of shops on it at the moment. And this was in the way of where the terminus was supposed to be. But of course, the tramways, they had a way of dealing with buildings that got in their way. They knocked them down. But we're going to look at that triangle before it was knocked down. And we're starting with the blue building to the left hand side there, which was the old provincial bank. And we're standing roughly outside where Pratamanger is now and we're looking through what became Orford Place towards Red, Red Lion Street. And what you can see in the centre of the picture there is the Goose and Gridiron. Now the Goose and Gridiron public house was quite well, well, well known in Norwich. It had a reputation that young ladies of low morals and soldiers frequented the place, which led to riotous behaviour. So I'm sure we'd all avoid that on a Saturday night, wouldn't we? However, if we move to the right of the Goose and Gridiron and go towards Red Lion Street, we come to the buildings on the Red Lion Street itself. And we'll start with the building in yellow. And there is the tobacconist shop. And next door to the tobacconist shop, we've got Miss Harcourt's haberdashery shop, uh, and then a harness shop, all shops that would, be, would have been quite common at the time, but obviously we don't see much of them nowadays. Now, just please remember um, Miss Harcourt's shop and that little run of shops, because we're going to see them again in a moment. But now we're going to see the effects of the trams on this area, because all of these shops were destroyed and the tram terminus was built. And if we move forward a few years, we see Orford Place in all of its splendor, much bigger than it is today, obviously. Looking at this picture, on the left-hand side, you've got Curls, which obviously was became Debenham's store. The original store was bombed and destroyed in the Second World War. And on the right-hand side, the rather lovely Burlingham buildings. Now, of course, they are still there. And you may have thought in passing, why is this grand building in this sort of, well, it's a loading bay more than anything else now, isn't it? Um, but of course, in its time, it did overlook this rather nice Norwich plain. So that's the, the center of the tramway system, the terminus. But what about Red Line Street itself? Well, looking back to this 1884 map, you can see that it was a very, narrow street. But however, it did contain four public houses. They all were in the way of the trams. So the tramways had their way of dealing with things. But let's have a look at the street before the trams destroyed it. This is Red Line Street looking um, toward from sort of the bottom of Orford Hill, looking towards Wesselgate St. Stephen's. And you can see on the right hand side, there's Mrs. Harcourt's shop and the other shops we saw earlier on. <coughs> Looking at it from the other direction, we're now sort of at the 
bottom of St. Stephen's looking towards the castle, <coughs> we can see that it's very, it looks like a very nice um, street of old houses, probably Tudor and Georgian, this type of thing. Wouldn't knock it down today, but of course they were in the way of the trams. So down they all came. The big problem, of course, was that there were four public houses on this street. So it was very important to get your priorities right when you were rebuilding. And as you can see, the first building to be built was indeed a public house. If you look um, to the left, you can just about see a building on the end there. And we'll see that building again, because that building is still there today. But let's now look at the impact of knocking down that street and what was put in its place. This is a picture that which you would easily recognize today. This is the boulevard that Red, <coughs> Red Lion Street became. And of course, the opportunity to rebuild a street in the center of the city was not missed by some of the biggest businesses who employed some of the best architects of the time. So you had Boardman and Skipper and other Norwich eminent architects who built these buildings along Red Lion Street. Um, now, there was no plan to this. They all did their own design. So you can see and you can still see today is this mixture of buildings, all of which were built round about the same time in the very early 1900s. Yet now, over the period of time, they all sort of meld together into what we now know as, as Red Lion Street. Let's now look at the final bit of the problem. How do we get the trams from the Red Lion Street area, the off place, into Castle Meadow? If you look at the picture of the Bell Hotel over there, you can see that there was a building to the right of it was in fact quite a large ironmongery shop. It was in the way of the trams. So down it had to come. And here we can see that the picture of that area. And you can see this scaffolding by the side of the Bell Hotel. And that is where the tobacconers used to be. And of course, coming back to that house, that building we saw earlier on, Boston shop there, as I'm sure you all recognize it's still there today. So not all of Red Lion Street was destroyed and we did get a rather nice boulevard in its place. So there's all swings and roundabouts. But let's now look at what happened to that gap. And there we are, it's still there very much like this today. We could be riding on that tram. So let's pretend we are and we'll drive through the gap and we'll come to Castle Meadow. But it's not the Castle Meadow of today. What you can see there is a very narrow Castle Meadow. Later in 19, 1920s, it was widened so that it became the wide street that it is today. So we can get the trams into Castle Meadow. We can get them round so we can go down um, to the station and out to Thorpe, but we want to get them out the other way, especially into St Andrews and then along St Benedict's. That presented a bit of a problem. As we turn round into Bank Plain, we want to go um, down Redwell Street and somehow or other get to St Andrews. But if you look at the original 1884 map, you can see getting into Princess Street is going to be very difficult, a very sharp turn there. <coughs> and so the tramways had to find a solution and the tramways had that usual solution. Let's knock down some buildings. So this whole swathe of buildings were knocked down so that the trams could come through. Again, we're going to go back and have a look at it before the trams knocked it down. This is the view from St Andrews. Right slap bang in the middle is a very old, apparently it's a Tudor public house that was known as the City Arms. Now the tram company had to pay quite a lot of money for this building because it was quite a big building, but they did secure it. And of course, the first thing they did was knock it down. Next door to that, 
you can see Gosset House, or sometimes called Armada House. Now bear in mind that the tram is go tram line is going to swing round to the left. So you might think they could miss out Gosset House, but of course they didn't miss it entirely. They skimmed off a whole wing, and we'll see that in more detail in a bit. So work begins, and there we go, work in progress. The, the way they knock things down, we think was pretty simple. It was a sledgehammer and a great big cart. So you have to applaud them for what they achieved. And this whole process is only going to take two years to do all of this demolition. So they're well on their way to get there, there now. And let's have a look at the results afterwards. Well, Redwell Street, we can see the hole where the trams go through. But overall, not, not a not a major change, and we know that there's going to be a curve in a curve in the road. But by and large, no no major difference. If we look at the other end now. Of course, the city arms have gone, and there we can see Gosset House. And if you've ever wondered why it's this rather strange shape, you can probably imagine it now with the wing on the other side, and that's what disappeared. But uh, we're used to it now and it's sort of okay. The final area we're going to look at is the area um, around uh, Tomland, Wenson Street. If you look at the picture of Tomland, there's a couple of things which are quite fascinating. First of all, all the urinal. Isn't it a wonderful piece of structure? <laughs> of course, it's, it's not there anymore, um, but um, what happened to it, I've no idea, but it, uh, it sort of takes the uh, the centre of the picture there. The other thing, of course, is the Maid's Head Hotel. It's not, doesn't appear to be there. Um, you've got uh, grey drapers, um, and there's there's none of the wood wooden mock Tudor stuff on on the building either. So that's not there yet. And if we look to the left, we can see Wensome Street. Now this isn't the Wensome Street of today. Um, it obviously follows the same line, but when you look at what the trams needed to do, you'll see that all of the fronts of all of those buildings have been sliced off, and either the whole building was knocked down or the front of it was taken away. And so you had Wensom Street, Firebridge Street, and further along down Wensom, down um, Madeline Street. <coughs> Some of the corner of Cowgate was taken away. And coming now back to where the process finished, we're back into Tomland, not long after 1900. And of course, what you can see is <coughs> the Maid's Head have got all of its Tudor cladding and the tram lines are in and we're all ready. So now we have the tram lines, we have the trams ready to go. What happens next, Francis? So on the 30th of July, 1900, the city's first tram service is run. And here we see Orford Place in all its glory. And luckily for us, a reporter was about on that morning and he produced this lovely article in the evening news, which really gives us an idea of the atmosphere of the day. And here it is read by Derek James. At half past nine in the morning, some 14 cars were out and one stood waiting for passengers at the terminus of each of the Earlham, Thorpe, Deerham and Magdalen Road routes. It is not too much to say that all these suburbs were literally agog. The ladies craned out of their windows forgetful of nighties and curling pin. The street boys began crowing to each other by the sidewalk and the men stood looking on with that critical unemotional air which distinguishes the Englishman in the presence of the unfamiliar. The people on the top seats as they approached the steep slopes of Guildhall Hill bore the air of a party of excursionists about to attack the long slope of the Switchback Railway. Whether or not the driver had forgotten to allow this in the use of the brake for the added weight of half a hundred human beings is not clear. At all events, the car plunged down the hill with considerable sway on her. 
The attitude of the public to the tramway is one of unstinted admiration, mingled with surprise. They had seen the metals being laid and the wires hung, and they had come to understand in some way that it meant travelling without engine of horses. But apparently they only half believed it. It was easy to see that for the most part the passengers were as pleased as a child with a new toy. Years, the public had witnessed huge changes to Norwich's streets. And of course, this transformation continues as the public, passengers and other road users get used to having this newfangled horseless carriages on the streets. So let's look at the trams themselves in a little bit more detail. Now, there's no doubt that they fascinated the public. And one of the things that they were very interested in is that they were built very much on a push me, pull you basis, which meant that they were very rarely turned round. Instead, when they reached the terminal, the driver would remove the control handle and remove from the front, which is now the back, to the back, which is now the front of the tram. Meanwhile, the conductor swung round um, the pole at the top of the tram, which to connect it to the wires. And then he would flick across the rear of the upper seats. And then the tram is ready to move back in the opposite direction, like so. I hope, yeah, I hope you're impressed with that. It took quite a long time to get that sorted out. So what else can we tell about the trams? Now, as we can see, they were double decked. They were open topped. And on each side, they had a unique fleet number. Um, they were had a livery of maroon, ivory, um, embellished with gold, which was much admired. Now, the other thing to note, the drivers such as George Hill, who is here at the control of number eight, didn't have much protection from the elements. So maybe it is a sort of no surprise that later on his daughter Millie recalled her father coming home after completing a late December's night shift and he had little icicles hanging from his moustache. As I say, this fascination um, re really sort of spread across the city. And again, we found this lovely article in the evening news um, who reported on one gentleman who on the first day that the trams ran not only gave up a day's work, but then spent 17 pennies just traveling aimlessly backwards and forwards across the city. And for other people, they built up a lifelong affection for the trams and amongst their number was a certain Russell Gamble. And here we see Russell's dad um, at the control of number 35. And in 1960, Russell made a model of his dad's tram. Here it is. And he donated it to the museum service where it was um, been at Gresson Hall. And it was very realistic. You'd be pleased to know that the upper deck seats, um, the, the rear of them could be flipped backwards and forwards. But we are hoping that the model of the driver isn't, doesn't look like his dad. But as part of the display, you can just see a little photograph in front of the, um, the tram, which we can now see in detail. And this was an early photo of the, of the uniformed staff employed by the Norwich Electric Tramways Company. You will note that they are all men. And you will see that the uniforms are very, very military in design, as would be appropriate at the age. But they have little accoutrements that show that the wearers are employed by the Norwich Electric Tramway Companies. So they have the badges and, and obviously the buttons with the NETC on. So we looked at the trams, but what was the effect they had on the streets? Now, it wasn't too bad an impact on those large tributary roads which led into the centre. As we said, they were wide, there was enough room for other traffic. But what about those narrow medieval streets, which we know were already chock-a-block with traffic, such, such as Gentleman's Walk? And I think this image gives us some kind of idea. And I think if you look there, whenever I see that photo and I see the, um, the cart in front of the tram, you don't think it's got much of a chance, really, do you? But the Norwich Mercury produced a map to show people where the tracks were going to run in the city. And we've highlighted them here in red. 
And I think it does really give you an idea of how much they impinged on the city's roads. And maybe one that was affected more than any other was St. Stephen's. Like today, it was very busy, but unlike today, it was one of those very, very narrow streets. And we've got an idea there. And maybe we really get an idea of how much they affected. This was when the tracks were laid. And I think what you've got to remember, it wasn't as though the trams were going to be running by themselves. You had all the other traffic going backwards and forwards. You had shops which had to load and load. So you can just imagine um, the traffic jams that ensued on there. But it wasn't all bad news. We found a rather nice article um, of, um, in the newspaper, which had a little letter from a lady called Muriel Rowe. And as a little girl, Muriel lived above the Maypole Bakery, which we can see on the next image. And you see the Maypole Bakery? So she lived just above it. And she used to say that as a little girl, one of the things that she enjoyed doing the most was waving at all those passengers on the top deck. And she always used to imagine that if her arms had been just a little bit longer, she could have reached out and touched them. So we've seen some of the impact of the trams on the on the city itself um, and the uh, the traffic within the city. But what about the impact on the people? Well, if you remember, one of the primary purposes of the tramways was to enable people to move in and out of the city. We needed a cheap mass transport system to enable the workers to move away from that crowded city centre and move to better accommodation on the expanding outskirts. And one of those, of course, was Unthank Road, as we can see here. But it wasn't just Unthank Road, it was all of the streets that were um, that moves out of the city. But if we come back and look at Unthank Road and look at the area um, that was expanded, we see this area marked in purple there, the area, everything between Glebe Road and Warwick Street. It didn't exist before the trams were there, yet because the trams ran all the way to, well, down on Plank Road, um, it enabled more building to be uh, commenced and more housing to be made in the area, which we now know as the, the Golden Triangle. So that was an expansion of existing area. But perhaps the biggest impact was to the, the north of the city. Now, this is the area um, in the north of the city with Magpie Road um, in the more or less the centre of the picture and Madeline Road and um, Elsham Road going up to the, to the left. In 1884, you can see there's very little development north of Magpie Road. But look at the same area just about 10 or so years later, rows upon rows of terraced housing. So a significant impact on the ability to move people out of the city centre into those new, which were considered very fine terraced houses um, just outside the city centre. So <clears throat> we, we have the tram system, but don't forget there were two sides to the tram system. Not only did it need to carry people, but it needed to carry people cheaply. Tram systems across the country were all capped in the price they could charge. In Norwich, <clears throat> the price cap was one penny per mile. So you couldn't charge more than the tram company, couldn't charge more than a penny a mile. And you can see some tickets here. And you can see there's a penny ticket, a penny hickey ticket, a tuppenny ticket, and so on. What you may not be able to see is that there are also some special tickets. Um, there's a worker's ticket. There's a scholar's ticket. And scholars and workmen were able to buy tickets at half price. So they could buy that, uh, that tickets to travel into work and come home lunchtime and go back to work again, half price. So that enabled an awful lot more people to be able to live outside the city centre. 
The other thing that uh, is worth noting on these tickets are the clips. Now they are clipped to signify the station that uh, the, the passenger has paid to get off at. And that clip had an ongoing impact. As Francis noted earlier on, everybody who worked for the train trams um, as company seemed to be male. During the First World War, of course, there was a shortage of men, so women took over a lot of the jobs. They certainly became conductresses on the tram system. <coughs> they didn't become drivers, but they did become conductresses. And of course, that led to a, a term that we still use today, that conductresses are still called clippies. <laughs> so we have uh, the people and the workers. What else were the trams used for, Francis? <laughs> Now, of course, this combination of cheap and reliable public transport also transformed how people could run the social life and in some areas became known as the gondolas of the people. Vehicles that could transport you on voyages of delight, maybe to the theatre, to the football or in Norwich, even up to Mousehold Heath. And amongst passengers who took advantage of such rides were Tony Hill, Hill's um, grandparents, and here Tony's recollections are again read by Derek James. Grandma used to tell me how on Sunday afternoons the ordinary working classes, like herself, put on their posh hats and then go for a ride on top of a tram. She said she liked it up there and felt like a duchess living the high life. She especially enjoyed the Newmarket Road route. Her and my granddad did their courting on the trams. They used to like looking at all the big houses and gardens which they could see from the open top deck. Another favourite route was along Thorpe Road to the Redan pub which stood at the end of the line. She liked it because it was a nice run at the end they could get off and have a drink. Yet although the trams had had a huge impact on the city when they were first introduced, after the First World War, this all begins to change for two main reasons. Firstly, there's a new kit on the block, the motor omnibus. It offers major advantages over tram travel, vehicles are more comfortable, and of course, they do not require huge investment in tracks. But in Norwich, there is another important factor. It's the rise of the interwar council estates. Now, as Michael has said, originally the um, tram tracks were built to service existing areas of settlement, which subsequently expanded as people wanted houses next to the public transport system. However, with the building of the new council estate, these links change. The new council estates aren't built near the tracks. And it's in 1925 that the Norwich Electric Tramway Company makes a huge change in strategy with the building of the Mile Cross estate. Basically, what happens is, it decides to abandon its Elsham Road um, route, which is um, which hasn't been that profitable, but at the same time, it introduces buses to service the estate. So we have this rather ironic situation. When the um, trams were first built, it enabled families to move from poor quality accommodation in the city out to better quality um, accommodation in the suburbs, but with the building of the good quality council estates, this is going to lead and um, contribute towards the demise of the trams. Now the strategy first set in 1925 continues such that by 1933, 40% of the tramway company income doesn't come from the sale of tram tickets, it comes from the sale of bus tickets. Um, and um, by now there's a general agreement that buses are more comfortable, more efficient than trams. 
But although the tramway company had cheerfully abandoned their um, lower income earning um, services, they refused to make the shift on their more profitable routes, such as Madeline Road, Earlham Road, and Thank Road. So you may say, right, fine, why doesn't a bus company just set up in competition? Well, legally, a bus company couldn't pick up or set down passengers on a pre-existing um, tram route, so the company had monopoly power and refused to shift. But in 1933, a predator swoops when the Eastern Counties Omnibus Company buys all the shares in the Norwich Electric Tramway Companies, not because it wants to run trams, but it makes a calculated gamble. It gambles that if it takes over the tramway company, agrees to abandon the tracks and the services, it will be allocated the, the licenses and contracts it needs to be the supplier of major um, public transport on those profitable routes. In early 1935, the gamble pays off and the company from July onwards systematically start to abandon all the um, um, remaining routes until we arrive on a cold 10th December 1935 evening, the night the last tram runs in Norwich. It leaves the um, terminal at Orford Place, travels down New Market Road, and then winds its wends its way back to the Silver Road sheds. At the helm, we see George Hill. You remember we saw George earlier driving the um, the number eight tram. And for that night, he felt like a superstar. People even asked him for his autograph. And rather poignantly, when he died in the 1940s, his, um, his funeral procession followed the exact same route of that last tram, the night when he knew that he was the most important man in Norwich. So, as we come to the end of our talk, we hope that you now realise that the story of the Norwich trams is about more than a vehicle. We've had to go through the information at quite a lick, but if you would like to know more, we do know of a really, really good book. But what we'd like to do is just finish and give the final word to Derek James as he reports on that night in on the 10th of December 1935, the night that the last tram ran in the city. This was an evening of nostalgia rather than regret. A crowd of 500 had gathered in Orford Place, cheering and waving as the last tram began its journey. By all accounts, it was a raucous trip, with passengers on the top deck yelling, are we downhearted? No. Despite the bitter cold, the spirit of revelry continued down St Stephen's as people on the pavement shouted and applauded enthusiastically. Along Newmarket Road, residents stood at the gates to witness the last tram, whilst by now, Old Lang Syne was the anthem of choice, though at the Eton Terminus, passengers rang the changes with renditions of Old Faithful, the last roundup and roll along covered wagon. By the time the tram started its journey to the sheds, it was accompanied by a long trail of cars and bicycles. Passengers cheered and rang bells. Once they arrived at Silver Road, all gathered and joined in one final rendition of Old Lang Syne. The trams had done their job, but it was now time to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>